should say, and some of you may know here, there is currently a lively debate about whether there is a part instinct. That is, whether we as a species have evolved over the eons, special purpose organs or uh, systems in the brain dedicated specifically to the perception and production of art. The alternative view being that the arts are byproducts of other capacities, perception and cognitive that we evolved. That is a very large debate and one that I'm not going to try to tackle tonight. We'll save that for another day. So my sense of uh, the evolution of style is really uh, as an analogy using the model of competition and selection, either in culture or history or in one individual perceiver. So we'll get very to the um, I should mention a big point. Uh, as I go through the talk, I'd like to uh, note how some of these ideas apply to some of the wonderful pieces that are in this exhibition around you today. Time. The, the traces of time and presence. I think there's really terrific work here. Uh, and so I'll try to uh, say some uh, things about how the two theories I'm going to consider can be used to uh, evaluate these works. Maybe the artists will disagree with me, but we can save that part for the discussion. So, uh, experience. The first uh, theory is the theory that I call seeing is believing. So as some of you may know, <clears throat> half a century ago, uh, Ernst uh, Gomery, a very eminent art historian, posed what he called the riddle of style. The riddle of style, he asked. He said, is it, why is it that uh, so many different uh, ways of representing the world have been come in different times and places? I should mention that uh, in this classic book, of Art and Illusion, Gomberg was dealing with pictorial arts primarily, so he emphasizes manners of representation or ways of representation as the, uh, the characterization of style. But the same question can be asked of the expressive arts uh, as well as design. So you might ask why have there been so many expressive forms in different times and places over the, over the years? <coughs> Well, Gomberg's answer was a psychological one. He appealed to the perceptual psychology of his day, and he said that the reason there have been so many styles, so many maps of representation, is that every perceiver brings to every act of perception a pre existing category or concept or stereotype or scheme. I use different terms to, to refer to these mental representations, ways of categorizing the, the perceptual world, those are acquired through experience, <coughs> sorry, and they're stored in memory. And they're reflected in different, different styles. Uh, and uh, now we're arguing on that basis, famously, then there is no innocent eye. Uh, none of us approaches are already uh, and seen, uncluttered by pre-existing beliefs or concepts or categories. Perception is always biased by the experiences that you've had before. It may be that even the innocence of animals can be uh, distorted. It turns out that you can condition pigeons to categorize herbs in accordance with their styles. They then acquire a bias of the kind of being they can. But in any case, <coughs> none of us is in a position of this of this cow. And uh, Albert's explanation of this was that uh, he argued for it rather by citing a number of charming examples from the history of art uh, in which artists uh, tried to depict the natural world or aspects of the natural world very faithfully, very realistically, and in every case seemed to fail because they uh, adapted the uh, new uh, perceptual experience to these pre existing stereotypes. Uh, so, to give you one uh, illustration of this point, this is, uh, you can see that. <coughs> this is a 16th century woodcut from Germany uh, during a time in which there had been apparently an invasion of locusts in parts of Europe. And the artist was uh, playing the naturalist uh, and uh, trying to represent these new uh, organisms uh, for the benefit of educating the people there. 
think uh, as Governor Quinn said, you all agree that it's highly unlikely that the locust will be anything like this. What the artist has done is adapted parts of other animals that were familiar to him and fit the locust into that mold. Don Rick even suggests that because the uh, German word for locust translates roughly as hay horse, uh, the artist was biased to give the uh, locust in this one kind of kind of prancing head. So they took his familiar stereotype of the horse and fit, tried to fit the uh, locust into it. I was reminded of this example by the lovely insect carrier who's seen on the wall here, Tom Dykus uh, has made. Uh, and I noted that uh, it seemed as if he was uh, working on the basis of a kind of uh, rich and pop of, uh, of uh, art and design. So Tom says that uh, he consciously uh, exploited existing stereotypes of familiar animals and then took liberties with them. Correct me if I'm wrong about this. Uh, Tom adding or deleting wings or fans as he felt was appropriate to to represent, but the goal was to make a kind of science fiction that made something alien but in order to make the alien familiar uh, using these pre existing stereotypes. So he says in his earnest statement, the results are something alienly familiar, a fictional realism. That's, that's very much the way Gombrich argues that we all work in perceiving the world every day. And I noticed, by the way, it was told by one of the uh, curators here that a young uh, gallery goer uh, who was caught up in his own schema of uh, gray walls, let's say, uh, criticized the image for being uh, unrealistic, that is, it had to be made. So he took the alien to be a representation of the alien to be a representation of the real. And there's another example, being in the gray line, the schema for the stereotype under a firm grip in the child's case. Uh, it's important to note that this theory that seeing is believing, that the way we see things is a function of pre-existing categories and concepts, extends beyond the realm of representational art. It doesn't just apply to your pictures that depict objects and uh, events. It applies, according to Comerick, to fabric, uh, to embroidery, uh, in this case to uh, Roman um, mosaic. On Comerick's view, Images like this are codes. They're notational systems of a certain kind, and uh, we, we thus read them in a way that's biased by the codes that we've acquired for parsing patterns or motifs or something of that sort. So the idea is that even something like this, which doesn't represent anything in particular, it does give you a sense of form and space, and it organizes form and space. Uh, so it has a kind of overall composition and a figure around uh, arrangement. Uh, different perceivers might perceive it in different ways depending upon the motifs and patterns that they encountered previously. So the, the idea is that uh, <coughs> an image is pretty bad. Uh, are you familiar with Necker cubes? Uh, the thought is that these patterns are something like Necker cubes. The image fades uh, out here with if you can see it properly, what you can see is this, this cube is a classic ambiguous figure. The perspective can be seen in different ways in the front is toward you and then uh, it's recent backwards. The thought is that some people can see it only one way because they get to kind of perceptual bias. Well, this is important because it means that the theory that seeing is believing can extend to Aaron uh, uh, Dimmick's form. Uh, this lovely poetry that you see around you. Here, which is uh, very uh, schematic and irregular. Uh, and the, the uh, thought I would suggest is that, at least for me, uh, the idea that even motifs and patterns like this can be biased by your perceptual experience was revealed when my experience of those motifs changed as soon as I got close enough to read the words. I think that once you understand what she's saying in these works, Way in which you see what appears to be regular patterns will, will change. So, uh, this is the idea that all perception is biased, and I uh, want to uh, say that another important point about this, this, this theory is 
that it isn't just intended to explain the basic level of perception. It isn't intended just to explain the way you see objects and categorize them perceptually, but it's intended to explain aesthetic experience as well, the way in which paintings have aesthetic properties. Uh, so I'll give you an example. This is from uh, a psychologist named Barbara Solso. This is a painting by George Delatour called Joseph and Carpenter. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but in any case, also argues, I see me in your way here. Uh, also argues that uh, once you know the title of the painting, if you're familiar with the tradition, you will immediately infer that the boy is Jesus. And if you have the requisite beliefs, then the light that's reflected from his face will be amplified by a kind of divine inner glow. So the aesthetic experience then is a result of the effect that, uh, that the light properties are part of the aesthetic quality of the painting. Uh, the aesthetic properties are affected by your beliefs. And I was reminded of this example by uh, Michael Parrott's uh, artist statement, which he talks about his attempt to simulate ancient icons in what he calls relics, so that we can, quote, see the divine. And I suggest that uh, the effect of uh, seeing these, these uh, wonderful pieces, uh, which appear at first glance to be metal, there's a kind of analyzing process I take in involved in it, but, but once you learn that they really are uh, the discardable plastic utensils, uh, cups and, and saucers and forks and so on, then your experience of the seemingly shiny or corroded, as the case may be, surface of the apparent mineral objects will change. And the way in which it changes, I think, depends upon what you take the artist to say or the problems happen to be. So it might be the case that if you see these as expressions of the hope of reclamation, not just of the plastic items, but of the society that created them under the influence of the arts, and then they certainly brighter, just as the face of the way it's painted. If you see them as expressions of irony or anxiety with respect to the society that produced them, then they may grow deeper. As I read the artist's statement, it seems to me that maybe the best description is what they express is uncertainty in that regard, in which case perhaps the shine and sheen flickers and glows just like the light reflected from the flickering candle. So uh, that's the key idea that aesthetic experience is uh, affected by all kinds of beliefs, even at the most basic level of the way you experience color and light in the painting. That's Godfrey's the theory that seeing is believed, believing and applied to art. <clears throat> and as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, Godric, uh, though he was a great historian, was very knowledgeable about science of his time. He was influenced by two people. Uh, one, uh, the psychophysicist Hal Holtz, who argued that on the basis of psychological evidence that perception depends upon unconscious inference. And the other, one of the founding fathers of cognitive science, Charles Bruner, who argued that all perception depends upon belief. Perception is theory of latent, as, as Bruner put it. So, so Godwin was no uh, mere humanist, I might say. Uh, he was knowledgeable in the science of his times. Uh, but I don't think we should be too impressed by that. Uh, because I think there are reasons to think that, first of all, vision is less variable than the seeing is believing theory implies. There are individual differences, I'll suggest, but perhaps not to the extent and not in the way that this theory implies. And uh, there is reason to think that we respond to the works of art, including those here in the gallery, at a more primitive level than the cognitive level that the seeing uh, is believing theory suggests. And this view is supported by science as well. So, it isn't just we philosophers who continually relate the issue of the scientists that I agree and disagree with it. Uh, so let me give you an example of this second line of thought, how you might understand how uh, perception might work when, it, when the object of perception is a work of art. Uh, this comes from a very uh, eminent neuroscientist, Robert Livingston at MIT. 
This is an example that is being widely discussed here. It was reported in the New York Times about two years ago. This is the you may be familiar with their ideas about how to understand Mona Lisa's smile. Uh, of course, uh, and this is the world's most famous painting. It's been seen by more people according to one book I read than the other painting in the world. Uh, it is the paradigmatic work for the art and for, for centuries. To uh, analyze the meaning of the painting, and particularly to try to understand the magnetic quality of Mona Lisa's smile. Some of these explanations have been very theoretical indeed. Uh, for example, uh, there have been a number of psychoanalytic accounts that have been given of the meaning of the Mona Lisa by Freud and others. Uh, one line argues that uh, Leonardo had. Uh, Oedipal feelings for his mother, and those were revived by the model of the Mona Lisa who reminded him of his mother. And his way of dealing with that was to repress those feelings, to project himself narcissistically into the painting, and make it into the blend of the The plot here is that as the boy saw the Mona Lisa through the lens of his own beliefs, in this case, um, what Freud would call neurotic, unconscious beliefs and desires. But uh, if the theory of seeing and believing is correct, then once you have that knowledge, you should see the Mona Lisa in a different way as well. So here's a simulation of your experience now that I've given you this information. <laughs> Well, what makes it argument is that it's not necessary to go to the level of analysis and theorizing. Not to say that it's wrong, it could be correct, but the point is that much of the aesthetic experience of the Mona Lisa can be explained in much more basic and primitive terms. And in order to, uh, to, to tell you her account, about her account of the Mona Lisa's smile, I just want to uh, call your attention to a fundamental principle in cognitive science, one that some of you but a sort of basic notion uh, that, that is uh, widespread now, and that is that there is functional specialization in the brain. Uh, this doesn't sound surprising. Of course, we all know that there are other an auditory system, and there's a visual system, and there's a tactile system, and so that sounds like specialization. But there have been times in the history of neuroscience where people argued that any neuron could take on the child of any other neuron. So there was a kind of equipotentiality the new doctrine of functional specialization is inconsistent to some extent with that. So, for example, the idea uh, is expressed in terms of what are called modules, <coughs> the idea that there are these parts of the brain, maybe anatomically isolated or segregated from other parts of the brain, or processes that respond selectively to certain stimuli. And these modules can operate more or less independently according to this one you know, version of the theory of functional specialization. Uh, and uh, here's an example of that. Uh, the uh, part of the brain that's, that's colored in red, um, there's an area called the fusiform gyrus, and the fusiform gyrus is known to respond selectively to bases. So there's a certain sense in which that part of the brain can be seen as a face recognition the related idea is that there are systems in the brain that uh, may be larger than isolated modules. These are types of cells with certain response properties that fall along that dedicated pathways running through the, running through the brain. The two systems that uh, figure most prominently in uh, Livingston's account of the Mona Lisa are what are known as the quad compare system. Again, this may be familiar to some of you. The what system is one that's responsible, as the term suggests, for object recognition? What it is that you're seeing there? The where system is the other one, and it's responsible for spatial location. So you have these two systems, one for identifying objects and one for locating them in space. And they're separate systems. The neurons respond in different ways to different stimuli. Importantly, for instance, and in particular, the where system, the spatial location system, responds to luminance contrast in painting. We can speak of that as value, uh, brightness contrast. Uh, that's another way to describe it. 
Whereas the watch system was paused to find brain details and was not sensitive to luminous contrast. Parenthetically, these systems split off into other systems down the road. There's a separate color system, a color system, I'll say, a little bit of 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 a
perception is sometimes linked to a theory of vision called interactive vision. The idea is that we process information by virtue not of a single system working alone, but by ways in which these systems work together in a little more interactive way. So um, these I call these interactions I call perceptual strategies because they are essentially responses to perceptual challenges uh, presented by whatever the work of art happens to be. It's important to note here that uh, the explanation that Livingston has given, and I'll give you another example of this approach in a moment, uh, is of a process that requires very little knowledge to be involved. So it's not as if your beliefs play a role in the appreciation of the moment's smile or this account. This is largely a bottom-up bottom -up approach. Uh, but there can be individual differences. And so remember the question that one of the questions we're concerned with is to what extent can there be individual differences in the way we see the world, both in natural, uh, in natural scenes or in works of art? To what extent are visual processes common? And the argument here is that first view uh, involves a lot of perceptual plasticity. There's widespread and pervasive individual differences as a result of background knowledge and belief. This theory allows for limited individual differences not based upon beliefs, but on things like, for example, the way your eyes move. So people scan uh, works of art in different ways for different reasons that I won't go into now, but uh, that's a way in which there might be uh, different uh, responses to a work of art from this, from this point of view. Well, it might still be thought, however, that some people certainly would argue that uh, even this theory allows for too much in the way of individual differences. This is an issue, by the way, in science, a fundamental question about how much perceptual plasticity there is that resonates well with art. Since one of the radio questions is on art and its current aesthetics, in case it's, um, is art a universal language? <clears throat> is it something that we can understand? Or do the arts and the styles of art speak only in local idiom, so to speak? That, familiar with the local culture can, can grasp. Uh, so the question of the nature and extent of plasticity is one that's important, I think, uh, in different arts. So you might think that uh, even this theory allows for too much individual variation, and that the reason is that it overemphasizes the interaction across systems uh, that uh, you've seen in the example. Lisa, I'll give you another example in a minute. Uh, claiming against that, as I suggested a moment ago, uh, it's possible to explain our perception of objects and events in the world and in works of art by using a single system of acting alone. A single system which is the same in every viewer, which is driven largely in a automatic way from the bottom up. Uh, and certainly, there are people, artists, scientists who have held this kind of view. Uh, it's well known, for example, boy, the color is terrible. Man. I'm sorry that you're missing this beautiful Cezanne uh, painting, uh, one of the many paintings that are outside of the Trois that Cezanne made. Uh, I can pass around my color and that is a little hell, but uh, in any case, the, the point is that it's well known that Cezanne believed that the function of art was to analyze <clears throat> the natural world and scenes into basic geometrical elements, cubes and spheres and cones, uh, which he thought uh, had a kind of uh, eternal independent existence, uh, as, as the philosopher Plato might have said. So I was just sort of outlined uh, uh, how these uh, geometrical forms might be seen in this image of the uh, Saint-Étoile. Well, there is some reason, some psychological evidence to in fact, uh, we do first scenes in the way that Susan was recommending artists encourage us to do that is by breaking it down into a vocabulary of visual elements <coughs> uh, or forms on the basis of which the objects are recognized. So this is uh, from a uh, psychologist, Irving Peterman, uh, who's at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, and Peterman has argued that and uh, we are equipped all of us with a vocabulary of basic visual elements. Actually, I think that uh, sometimes the artist, there's a tendency to uh, convey this, to teach uh, drawing and painting using vocabulary forms. It's been meaningful to invest in 
ministerial than we should. But uh, when Biederman has uh, argued that with the basic vocabulary of 24 geons, as he calls the geometric elements, you can recognize any object in the world. And uh, these are all, uh, these, these, these little elements are independent of any perspective or point of view, so that means that they're universal. Seeing something from one perspective or another. The thought here is that you, uh, the way you identify an object is by the parts are identified by characteristic points of intersection. Uh, if you show people three points of intersection of any object, they can identify the object reliably. The hypothesis is that they're using this vocabulary of forms. Well, I want to resist this model. I think it's, uh, uh, it goes too far to. Uh, direction for explaining how you see the world. And uh, there's a variation on it that uh, has now uh, lost, I think, some of its credibility. An earlier version of the line, for the most influential laser physics scientist, David Moore, who argued uh, his, his elements were different from, uh, a little different from the bigger ones. So, the uh, theory like this, there's always a question of what are the elements. Uh, but in any case, specifically applying the theory to recognizing objects even in semi-abstract art. That's what Kelsey thinks you see here. So, but the resistance to this theory uh, I am and that other people have is that it suggests a kind of mechanical process for recognizing objects. It's sometimes referred to as a simile line. The idea is that the visual system begins at the most elementary level by uh, recognizing lines or edges and it uses the basic uh, visual elements and it uses those to construct objects. Uh, and that kind of sequence leading to a rather uh, detailed and elaborate representation of the world. I'm not going to spend any time arguing against that except by way of example uh, to show you a, an illustration from Cezanne again, in which uh, it seems to me that the case can be made that although there is evidence that Emphasizing basic geometry here, you can see that the tail down on the surface of the bow. In fact, the way the visual system works, even in parsing the basic shapes that make up the, the objects, the bow, and the things in the background, depend upon an interaction with the power system. Uh, so I can refer again to uh, Margaret Levick's that this is her book too. Uh, she argues that <coughs> in this example, There is a kind of color spreading effect. That is, when you look at this uh, water color as it is, you don't think that the boat is really partially colored or that the buildings and the roofs are really partially colored. You see them as uh, more homogeneously colored across the surface than they are as a matter of fact. And Livingston argues that that's not an inference from your part, it is an informal belief uh, that, well, there's color here, so it must be colored there. That the context tells you somehow that you're not looking at what I became those uncertain buildings or not often are in the background. So the claim is that there is a literal experience of the spread of color across the surface of the, uh, of, the, of the various objects that are there. Of course, the idea isn't that you know, suddenly the color begins to flow across the surface and, and completely uh, entirely around it. And <clears throat> there is no well defined edge. Uh, or if you can say that the color begins and ends, uh, it spreads gradually out into space, so to speak. And the reason is the way the neurons are built in the color system code color, which is say, very coarsely, so that in the areas that are responded to by neurons where there is no kind of signal, uh, they're receptive fields, the color of the visual field that they respond to are invaded by receptive fields of the neurons where there is color signal being sent and color seems to expand. The point really is that it doesn't expand the only contours. So there's something about color spreading, which is a well known phenomenon, that uh, makes it depend upon or interdependent with contours. Uh, you may have seen that this Ben Sean painting called Triple Dip. Uh, uh, that is a painting by Ben Sean in which he intentionally makes the colors of the 
ice cream. Uh, you know, out beyond the uh, boundaries, but you don't receive it that way. There's a kind of a rubber band effect that I've ever seen full impact into uh, the, the uh, contours of the ice cream. But well, the point then is the second point then is that it isn't just the colors that are in Pickwick here, it's the contour ones too. And uh, what Livingston argues is that uh, just as the contours constrain the spreading of color, so does the spreading of color contribute to the perception of complete contour lines. That is, the sense to the extent that the color begins to seem to be more homogeneous across the surface, the more the surface seems to be an integrated and coherent. So we have two systems working together. This is the idea of interaction and strategy of the color system and the, uh, and the contour perception system creating a kind of kind of coherent image. So that's my suggestion that, uh, that even though uh, Cezanne does use uh, well-defined contour lines and geometrical streets, the theory of interactive vision explains uh, his art better, I think, than uh, the medium style does. One thing to mention here that's important is that this also allows the visual system to economize on the use of its resources because the color system and the line system interact. It isn't necessary for the visual system to code information. So if there is a kind of evolutionary epistemology in science, there's an evolutionary epistemology in science. One thing that's important to mention here is uh, that for Albert and Popper, uh, scientific hypotheses are not just accepted and perpetuated on the basis of their content or the ideas that they express. Sometimes the form matters as well. And in some forms given to hypotheses are taken to be uh, preferable to others because they facilitate the testing process of the evolution of knowledge generally in contrast to those that might hinder it. So famously, Popper and others argued that in science, we should prefer the simple hypothesis sort of the complex one. Simplicity is a virtue of hypotheses, no matter what content they have. The reason is that simple hypotheses are easy to test. Of course, simplicity is not going to be the uh, gold standard for preferences and styles, but the thought might be that there are forms in science that somehow facilitate uh, evolution of them as, uh, as well. <coughs> well, I think there are reasons to resist this, uh, this idea. Uh, uh, for example, I think it's uh, not clear that styles, styles of an earlier era have the debunked status that scientific hypothesis of an earlier era do. Once a scientific hypothesis is falsified, it tends to be more. Nobody adopts the Ptolemaic system but we still treasure uh, older styles of art and not just for historical time. So the dynamic is different, I think, there. Most importantly, I think, I want to suggest that this approach to the history of style assumes that the artist, like the scientist, approaches his work or her work with a pre existing idea or intention or concept and then gives it form and puts it to the test. That is to say, it ignores the process of I think uh, this is an idea that was captured in the Michael Parents uh, artistic statement. He says, only once I began working with you, I began to understand the true potential of peace. Problems arise, solutions develop, and the only way is to work on the connection. I think that's, that's, that must be right. So to that extent, this is a mechanical model, I think, for the history of time. So what can the other model be? Well, um, coming back to the notion of perception as strategy, heuristic strategy, I emphasize the way in which this interactive model of vision economizes our resources in the brain. Can we develop a theory of style or a history of style? I emphasize that this principle of economy and business and my new works on how history. Well, I think there's some interesting ideas that have been proposed, but they're not quite right, at least in my view. So uh, one idea that's been proposed by Gunnarick himself is that uh, you can understand styles and like, looking concept and heuristic as 
styles are essentially uh, features that are the very features that we prefer to nature just carried over into a different context. Uh, so, for example, in nature, John McCarthy did the first symmetry because we take it to be a sign of fitness in potential ways. Uh, and unwittingly, then, we carry the difference of symmetry over into our connection with design. There. And this is obviously wrong if the claim is that uh, we prefer symmetry on the styles that go to the counties in this plan. Here's an opinion by Royal called the total ignorance. Uh, I suppose you could make a case that there's a kind of symmetry in the diagonal line in the rest of the middle. But it's pretty heavily weighted by uh, matter, subject matter on the left side of the painting. And yet, uh, this would be this one there, and I here, and I hope you've seen the painting before. The real subject of the painting is represented by this tiny, neat uh, emergent mark, which you might not notice in the first case you haven't seen the painting before. So it was really the most in the sun, contrasting the water and the ground. So it's precisely the asymmetry of this painting that makes it effective, I think. The claim is that it's probably there are no features, no ones, uh, feature of the set of features that we used to identify potential mates and features that would carry over to this reference to style. Well, maybe a more elaborate theory of uh, design. A view that's been expressed by the field of neuroscientists at the Salk Institute, B.S. Ramachandra, is that styles function like ecological triggers. So ecological, ecological triggers are features in nature that cause behaviors that are conducive to survival. Uh, these ecological triggers can be enhanced in some ways to make them more effective. And the wrong shot of work is that that's what, that's what artists do, especially like the food in their pain. Uh, and if, as it happens, you can produce a more powerful effect by exaggerating the scale of the ecological triggers. So if you paint three stripes on the scale, the milk chicks will respond even more vigorously. This is an example of what Ramachandra would call the peak shift. This is demonstrated in the laboratory when rats are trained to press a lever <coughs> under a certain geometrical shape. So they have to figure out that they were able to tell it to press the lever where the rectangle is, not where the triangle is. And uh, they can do this easily, and they, they're very consistent and generalized as you can move the rectangle around and still get it right. They form a category of rectangle. And it turns out that if you exaggerate the aspect ratio of the rectangle, they can form a relative to a of pressing the more vigorous less picture effect. And what I'm trying to argue is that what happens in that case is that the rats are picking up the essence of rectangularity. The more you exaggerate it, the more you get the essence of rectangularity. And that's what artists do. They, they, their, their, their function is to convey knowledge of the essence of objects. They do this by exaggerating the essential features of those objects. This works for uh, shapes, but also for colors. So he claims to use the classic phrase, all art is caricature. To caricature the essential features of whatever the, the art has to represent. But this is also, I think, a convincing theory for a number of reasons. The least of which is that Ramachandra has been criticized for the sexist implications that it has. He uh, suggests that uh, it's because we uh, are enslaved in a way of white painting pictures and grants to the kingship. That we prefer women with big breasts, so representation is of women with big breasts and small breasts, and of men with big biceps and, you know, and shoulders. That's an instance of the deep shift effect. So uh, it is hated out there. Arnold Schwarzenegger, I guess, was the parody of that compared to that attack. Aside from the fact that it's, although you can easily understand how you might exaggerate the nature of rectangularity, the question arises of how do you make a circle or a circuit? Make a square or square, can you exaggerate the squares? Or can you take an example like these oldest paintings, sorry, the color uh, in which uh, atypical or unnatural colors are used to depict faces? I think it's incredible to argue that uh, these paintings give you the essence of either face. 
this is hardly coincidence. So these are all starts in my view, which are both heuristics in some, uh, some kind, but, but not in the right kind. So let me uh, wrap up with, with uh, another example of uh, this interactive approach that suggests what I think works better. Uh, this can help me more part given a problem color on the screen, but this is a painting by Monet of Tommy Beals, and one of the things that's noted about it is sort of characteristic Impressionist paintings generally that there is spatial imprecision in the location of the objects is not well defined along with the use of lighting effects. And uh, people report that this is a very dynamic painting for them, so it's the original one that could be effective. They were seeing the copies as if they were waving in the breeze, and there was some kind of fluidity in the copies moving through the photographs. Livingston argues that the reason that's so, the reason you have this sense of movement and dynamism is, again, that Monet has used very uh, dramatically contrasting hues, perfect red or orange for the flower hands, and gold green or gray for the grass, but the colors are in the room. So what that means is that Monet has disabled the system that's responsible for locating the flowers in space, shifting the job onto the color system, which is inadequate to them. As a result, they're not precisely located to see the sweat or shimmer or something like that. And if we can do this quickly to the other things, okay, you can actually uh, demonstrate this at a website we hope you can get. Thank you. 
case come to mind. And that sounds a little serendipitous, so I would give me more time I would say more about the ways in which I think styles are perpetuated over time because there must be more to it than just somebody thinks I can do and everybody thinks it's cool. Uh, and so what I would say is that styles have a history because our encounters with styles affect the extent to which we can process them ourselves from. That is, the more we see them, it's not even just that they become more familiar, but we see them in context, like museums and galleries and so on. And the more they begin to appear in those museums and galleries, those contexts facilitate the processing of those styles. So we have uh, what are sometimes referred to as episodic communities, uh, prior encounters with images and works of art, and those are what cause styles to be described. They're located in that style. Okay, so to go back to where we began to allude, can there be a science of style? Well, I think it's uh, the case, I hope that I'm convinced, please, that uh, it's possible for cognitive science to shed a light on style, even to tell us something about the history of style. So that there can be only a science 